your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another edition of Into the Fray. First, thanks for being here. If you enjoy ITF, please rate and review it in Apple Podcasts. This helps others find it, which turns into more people with encounters for me to interview. If you'd like more content than the free weekly edition, go to IntoTheFrayRadio.com and click Become an Insider. It's only $4.99 a month or $54 for an entire year. And if you have an encounter you'd like to share, email me at shannon at intothefrayradio.com. If you've got shorter stories, feel free to call the hotline, 877-317-9111. You can call that anytime, toll free. My first book, Beyond the Fray Bigfoot, co-authored with best-selling author G. Michael Hoff, is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle editions. Once you're finished, please take a moment to leave a rating and review. For signed and personalized copies, send $19.99 via PayPal, free shipping within the U.S. only, to beyondthefrayllc at gmail.com. And last but not least, Jeff and I have created Beyond the Fray Publishing. So, if you've got a book you'd like us to publish for you, send us an email at info at beyondthefraypublishing.com. For general questions and information on us, visit our website, beyondthefraypublishing.com. Books we consider will need to be in the genres cryptid, paranormal, or true crime, both fiction and nonfiction. Thanks again, and that will do it for now. So, on to the show. No, thank you guys for being on tonight. And I want to do a, a nice little intro here for you both because everybody at Into the Fray will have heard Craig before, but this is, of course, uh, Melissa uh, Clevenger's first time on with us. And welcome to you both. This is Craig Nearing and Melissa Clevenger. Craig was first on with me for Into the Fray episode 80, and that was about the summer when Mansion in Wisconsin. And this was or is a building in ruins built in 1914 and there was plans to rebuild it and open it as a museum and bed and breakfast but I know it had a ton of activity that you guys investigated from uh, phantom lights to shadow people full body apparitions uh, it, it kind of ran the gamut there at Summerwind so before we dig into what we're going to talk about tonight which is of course a co-authored book between you two it is titled Archives of Ghost Hunter 2 so uh, can we get a quick update on what's going on with the Summer One Mansion there, Craig? Well, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot going on. We did uh, have a little bit of uh, work going on with uh, Jeff Belanger. Um, he's uh, one of the guys that was helping with, uh, does uh, ghost adventures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was going to actually try to find us a network to maybe possibly take on the possibility of... Uh, helping to rebuild Summerwind, but he says it's kind of a new concept. No one's ever rebuilt a house, you know, like a haunted house. And he says some people are afraid to do that because they mm. think they're going to lose money on the project. But it's a neat and interesting idea, so we're hoping that there's still somebody that might come forward and say, yeah, you know, we'd like to rebuild this house and turn it into what it used to be. Um, our team is actually going to be heading up there in a couple, well, in a couple months when it's warm, and going to be doing a lot of cleanup on the property and remo remo removing some trees and stuff, trying to make it a little bit nicer. 
Yeah, and if anybody wants to see this property, it's a gorgeous home, a, a gorgeous um, a building. It's massive. Uh, go to into the fray radio dot com, uh, into the fray eighty. But it, uh, honestly, if you just type in into the fray and Summer One Mansion, the images will pop up. And I neglected to say that you, Craig, you are the founder of Fox Valley Ghost Hunters, and then Melissa is their lead investigator. And Melissa, I know I was reading about you. You've had a lifelong uh, list of paranormal experiences, right? Like, you live and breathe this stuff. Yes, yeah, it's basically a part of my life, a part of who I am. It's kind of all I know. Now, you are... What would you label yourself as? Because I was kind of reading that you're really very sensitive to a lot of things. So are you are you psychic or are you a medium or are you just you just feel things when you walk into a place? Uh, so basically, growing up, I could always see um, ghosts or spirits. They didn't always communicate with me that way. Like they would just kind of walk past me, and they were just in my house, just sitting there. And um, but I was always told stuff, so I could. I always, I could hear a voice in my head and it would tell me kind of everything. I could first see kind of the future. I knew if somebody was going to pass away, I could tell people about their grandparents or just stories. I, through my whole life, I've always been told stuff. Um, I kind of stopped seeing the ghosts and spirits um, like in high school. And part of being an investigator, though, that's part of where I can still experience it because I'm missing that part. So just to know that, you know, they're still here and still around. So why do you think that stopped in high school? Is it is it the usual, uh, you know, you're you're just distracted because you have so much going on in high school? Or is it physical changes with you? Um, so I still now do see stuff once in a while. Um, to be honest, though, as I got older, the stuff I was told grew stronger. Um, kind of this last year, it hasn't been as strong. I don't know if that's just my physical life of what's going on. But um, yeah, I, I've always kind of been told stuff. And I don't really know why I, I don't see it as much. <laughs> is it, um, do you miss it? Or is it kind of early? I do. Yeah, I do miss it. I do miss it. Um, it, it was just, I've had it my whole life. It was I was used to it, and it was just kind of natural to me. So that's why I never did consider myself a psychic or a medium, because it was just normal. <laughs> what about scary stuff, though? Or, or were you just so used to it that nothing really ever got to you that much? Um, no, nothing ever really got to me. Everywhere I've lived, I've always had experiences. Um, sorry, Craig, are you shuffling around back there? Sorry, it's super loud. Nope, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I've had stuff everywhere I've lived, but, um, you know, doors slamming, cupboards being open, things rocking and voices and just everywhere I've lived. I don't really get scared. I haven't had anything. I don't think any of it has been bad or evil or demonic. It's, you know, I think they just know that I can hear them and they want to communicate. Right. Um, the only thing I'm really scared of is bats, <laughs> which are not paranormal. <laughs> it is what? I said the only thing I'm really scared of are bats, and bats, they're not okay. paranormal. They just happen to be right. the places we go. Yes. No, that's okay. I have a, a horrible fear of spiders, and those are tiny, silly <laughs> little things, and I just don't like them. So it's just your thing. So that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they do tend to be in abandoned buildings, and right, yeah. they're just they're <laughs> that's where they like to be. Yeah. Sorry about that, Craig. I I do the same thing uh, when I'm moving ar around. Like if I'm recording. I have to mute out if I have to move because I have the cre the creakiest chair on the planet and it's going to sound like <laughs> something else if I move and I'm recording, you know? Um, so how did you guys get teamed up to, to create uh, Fox Valley Ghost Hunters? Well, I started uh, a while back and that was in uh, 2010. And it basically just started out as a lot of family members that came together to do investigations. But after a while, they just kind of wanted to do their own thing. So I had to look for new investigators. So the best place that I could find investigators at the time were was Craigslist. And that was kind of the big thing of uh, putting an ad out there and getting investigators. But now with the different places that we offer for tours and uh, 
overnights and stuff, a lot of our team members have actually come off of uh, doing a lot of tours with us, and we get to know them and stuff, and they work out really well so that uh, they could be part of the team. And uh, I think, I can't remember how Melissa it was met me through uh, one of her friends that is also on the team now as well. Yeah, we were actually uh, part of a team out of St. Louis, which we live in Wisconsin. So like nine hours away, and we never could really do investigations much. So we were kind of hoping to find a team in Wisconsin, and my friend actually found Fox Valley Ghost Hunters. So we actually contacted Craig and been on the team ever since. So that's been about a year now. So the first volume, though, of Archives of a Ghost Hunter, is that is that you two as co-authors as well on that? Nope, uh, that was just me doing the co-author on that, or no, not co-author, I was just the author on that book. On my f- first two prior books, Wisconsin's Most Haunted, Volume 1 and Volume 2, I had a co-author from uh, Manitwitch Waters, Wisconsin. Her name was Enid Cleves, and she used to write about gangsters and stuff in the North Woods, oh, that's like cool. Dillinger and stuff, so... She actually hooked up with me on one of my tours and said, hey, it'd be really cool to start writing a book. So we did the first two. Then I did Archives of a Ghost Hunter. And now our book, me and Melissa, or Melissa and I, um, Archives of a Ghost Hunter Volume 2, hoping to have out in May. Very cool. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And it's got a a very creepy feel on the cover. I like that. I like that very (laughs) much. That's probably secretive maybe for right now. I don't know. But I like it. Um. Oh, by the way, is that secretive, or am I allowed to use that no. image at all? You can use nope, it. It's, um, it's okay, online. Cool. So. All right, cool. So, I'm assuming that this book is comprised heavily of investigations that you guys have done together? Yep, uh, and actually there will probably be a c- couple more that we still have to do to put into the book yet. So, I mean, what sorts of locations have you guys gone to, and what is included uh, in this book, like, what are some of your favorite locations or most poignant cases that you guys have covered? So, one of our newer places that we started doing is the Sheboygan County Insane Asylum. Um, we did tours there every Friday and Saturday night throughout the summer. So, we did over 200 hours of investigating there. Um, by far, right now, that's one of my favorites. Uh, we also will have First Ward School in Wisconsin Rapids, Summer Wind. Um, Craig, you can name a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the other things that will be in the book is also a house that we did in New Franklin, Wisconsin, that was done by the Dead Files as well. I think that's Amy and uh, that the police, uh, mm-hmm. the guy that's the policeman that goes around and does that. But they did the house in New Franklin, and we got a chance to go in there after them, and there was just some insane stuff going on in there, and that'll be all part of the book as well. But like Melissa said, the the asylum is just this massive place. It's 375,000 square feet. The roof takes up about two acres alone. There's uh, 17 different wings. We have access to about 15 of them. There's underground tunnels. There's uh, nurses wings and uh, surgery or a surgical center to it. It's just, it's just huge. And we just started up uh, um, tours again tonight for two dates in May and uh, they're almost sold out already. So uh, Melissa, is that where you are encountering the beloved bats? Is that the <laughs> yeah. asylum? A couple, a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow they probably know that you don't like them. And of course, we women have more hair than the guys usually. So uh, that, that becomes a little more terrifying when they start flying around, right? <laughs> My biggest fear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys watched The Office, but remember when the bat got in there and then Dwight captured the bat? with the bag while uh, Meredith was still underneath the bag. I was like, that, that, oh, I, I don't even think I would like that very much. And I, I don't <laughs> mind bats, but put spider on me. I'm screaming like bloody murders. Yep. Um, so what kind of things have b- gone on in the asylum? I mean, obviously it's an asylum, so probably some pretty horrible things when people were alive. So what's been going on since the place has been shut down? We um, have seen a lot of shadow figures. Um, Also with our ghost box sessions, like with the SB7 or Frank's box, we do get a lot of names and it's the same names every week. And what's really interesting on that is there's actually um, in the basement, there is a wall chart, a 
hype chart and it has names on it. And a lot of the names on there are actually ones that we keep getting across the ghost stocks, which is amazing. That's cool. And kind of sad though, too, right? That they're, that they're stuck there. You know, I think they know that we can communicate and we can hear them though. And I think they just want to tell their story. I mean, has any EVPs come through about like, if you act or ask a, a specific question, like, were you abused or how did you die or, you know, have you gotten inf- any information about that? No, there seems to be a lot uh, regarding the chapel area. There's a chapel in there as well. And a lot of the people that go into the chapel area, and even when I've gone into the chapel area, there seems to be, I wouldn't say it, a negative feeling, but kind of a, a sad feeling or maybe a, a desperate feeling in the chapel. Um, some of the, kind of the weird thing is, has happened to me in the chapel. I've been scratched in the in the chapel, and that's kind of a weird place to be scratched. I was also punched in, in there as well by something, and we'd had a lot of weird stuff coming through the ghost box, like uh, people were got, got hurt in there and stuff like that, or maybe taken advantage of in there as well, and it's just, it's kind of odd. So these scratches, is it the usual, the the three scratches, like the mock of the Trinity kind of a scratch, or? Yeah, I had three on me one time on my back, and then I had two down my leg. And actually, that was like the last investigation at the asylum that we did. And the owner had, for the first time ever, given us and the public access to the morgue that night. They opened Mm. up the morgue. And it seemed like whatever happened when they opened that up, something came out. I don't know, because that was like the craziest night. Um, Not only did I get scratched, but another person got scratched on the leg, and one guy had something poke him right in the eye. It's kind of of weird. I don't think I've ever heard um, something quite like that, somebody getting poked in the eye. That's uh, that's quite forward, gathering a a lot of strength, too. So what does it feel like, Greg, when you're when you're getting this scratch and you don't quite yet realize it's a scratch what does that feel like it's like a burning sensation and uh, then you're like well i i didn't scratch myself there in fact one time on my back there's no way i could even have reached my back where i had the scratches and uh it burned for a little while but then it went away and they were pretty much gone after that and what about the punch that you received where did you get hit that that was in the lower back or actually in the about in the middle of the back and it, it just kind of felt like this like a pressure, like something had smacked me there and it wouldn't go away for a little while. I'm like, I think something just hit me. Melissa, have you ever been uh, physically accosted while in the asylum? Um, I have actually not in the asylum. I've had amazing experiences there, but I have been scratched before at other locations. And with that, I can say it was kind of the same as Craig's. It's actually a burning feeling, but it's coming from underneath your skin. So it's like... Mm. I could feel burning under my skin and, you know, you look and then there's scratches, but, but yeah, I've, I mean, other than the chapel area, I feel good energy at the asylum. So they just really don't like Craig that much is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> no, and everybody says that too. So he's like, I'm not laughing because I'm tired of that joke. <laughs> um, so that's interesting though. You said that, the the owner opened the morgue. How long had the morgue actually been been closed off before he opened it that night for you guys? Well, it wasn't that it was actually closed off, but there's a elevator that goes to the bottom floor, and then the uh, morgue is on the other. So if you walk into the elevator, the elevator on the other side has doors on the other side. When the doors would open on one side, they would open on the other side, and that side would lead in, lead into the morgue. So he had a problem with the elevator getting stuck on the lower floor. So nobody wanted to go down to the morgue because they might be stuck in the morgue overnight. Mm. So this time he had propped it open so he could get into there. And I guess uh, recently since I had talked to him, he's going to be knocking a hole in one of the outer walls so he can just walk in from one of the other rooms into the morgue. So if any of the uh, investigators are late for one of these asylum investigations, you can... They, you know, you're the one going down to the morgue solo, you know, like they do to Aaron on Ghost Adventures. They're like, <laughs> yeah, you're going there all by yourself all night. Have fun. Yeah, um, and it's funny because the morgue is not that big. It's like uh, the size of a car, like a, like a mid-sized car, and that's about uh, it. 
small little room. Mm. It might be even worse in a way. Uh, claustrophobic <laughs> people, right? Really close yep. walls in a, a, a place that you know exactly what went on. Or maybe you don't, and that's what makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So is that one of you guys' favorite places to go because it is so active? I think it's more of uh, the lines of uh, being able to go somewhere where we were nobody's ever been allowed to go. There's been no other teams that were allowed to investigate in there, and we were actually the very first team that was given permission, and we're the only first team that got to do tours for the public to come in there and join us too. Very cool. Well, and you guys mentioned that you do a lot of tours, so... I mean, where can people find these tours? Is there a website for, for you guys specifically for the tour side of things? Uh, we do list it on our Fox Valley Ghost Hunters um, Facebook page. We also have um, Wisconsin's Most Haunted uh, Facebook page, and they're listed on there. And Is it on the paperback page, too? Yep. Um, yep. Wisconsin's Most Haunted on paperback as well. Very cool. I will make sure to link all of that in the show notes. So besides, now, did you guys say that you have been going back to the summer wind recently to do investigations? Yep, we were just there in, was the last time in August, June? I think? Was, or was August, it June? yep. We, we were there in June. We also went back in August. So a couple times this last summer. And it's still just as active there? Yeah, I still have quite a st bit of stuff happening. Um Definitely EVPs, disembodied voices and stuff. Um, some of the people would see shadows down in the foundation. Oh, and there's bats down there, too. That <laughs> Of course. To see, too. Yeah, Melissa's <laughs> got to have her bats, you know. She's like, oh, great. <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well just start accepting them. <laughs> yeah, you might have to just, like, build a bat house and see if you can make oh, friends with one. It'll probably be yep. the nicest bat ever, and then all the rest of them are just big old jerks, so that's usually how it goes. You're like, well, you're not a proper model for the bat species. So besides, okay, so we have the asylum, we've got summer wind. What are, I mean, really stories that have maybe changed your mind about things when it comes to the paranormal, or maybe swayed you in one way or the other about an opinion that you might have about, you know, shadow people or ghosts or any of this other thing that we, the phantom lights, which I find very fascinating. Has anything ever surprised you guys when you're out on an investigation? So I would say my biggest experience and probably my most memorable, um, it didn't change the way I think on stuff, but I actually, my brother passed away about 20 years ago and I have not been able to communicate with him at all. Um, so me and my husband went to Kansas to my dad's house and we decided to investigate and we did with the ghost box and asked a bunch of questions. Absolutely nothing came through the ghost box. Um, then we were driving back to Wisconsin and I listened to the audio and sure enough on the audio, my brother was communicating. Um, but basically, long story short, at the end, he said, Eric messed up, which was his name or sorry, I was killed, Eric messed up. So um, pretty much for 20 years, I've been blaming somebody, you know, for his death. And I think to me, that was just the moment of, you know, stop blaming. It, it was an accident and my brother's okay. So um, wow. that's one thing with investigating though, is, you know, your loved ones are still around and it's just. Wow. That, that was a cool story. Thanks for sharing that, Melissa. Yeah. I'm sorry about your brother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, what about you, Craig? What, what do you think is one of the more poignant moments you've ever had while investigating? Well, one, my, I had a girlfriend that passed away in 2015 of cancer. And uh, we used to have this little running joke between us. And she knew she was going to pass away. And I knew she was going to pass away at some point. And she had a tumor on her spinal cord. And she said if she ever passed away, she would continue to haunt me. And it was, you know, at the fun time, it was kind of funny, but sad in the same way. And uh, she passed away in 2015, and her mom had asked me to come to her house to see if I can communicate with her. So I had gone to her house, which was in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, and I said her name was Renee, and I said, Renee, are you here? And she goes, Craig, please talk. And this was coming through the ghost box. Mm. And her mom's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, 
um, asking her a couple of questions and she would answer me. So I thought to myself, I wonder if I could, you know, talk to her in other locations too, and not just where she passes away. Because a lot of people think that you can only talk to the ones that have passed away in the places that they have died, like they're stuck there for some reason. So when I'd gone back to uh, my place in Berlin, Wisconsin, where we used to hang out and stuff, I asked her some more questions on the ghost box, and she would actually come back on the ghost box and say that she missed me and she loved me. And I didn't believe it was really her. It was kind of hard to kind of fathom. So I said, Renee, I said, can you tell me what I used to call you when uh, we were together? And she goes, Munchkin. And it was kind of amazing to hear. I sent the audio clips over to her niece, and she's like, oh, my God, that's that's my, that's Renee. Mm -hmm. And every time I would turn on the ghost box, I talked to her for maybe seven months in a row. And uh, every time I'd turn on the ghost box, before I could even ask a question, she would say, her munchkin's here. Mm -hmm. And this would continue for quite a while until I said, you know, I kind of got to let go of this a little bit and not be so... Um, infatuated with it and kind of let her you know move on so i haven't done anything like that in a long time but basically my whole thing was as a paranormal investigator was trying to decide if you could really talk to everybody anywhere any given time it doesn't have to be where they just passed away mm -hmm. so with that with that point i've been proven that i could talk to her in numerous uh, locations that i've gone to really and she comes through just like that and says munchkin's here Yep. Wow. When's the last time you tried that? Uh, it's been a long time. I actually tried it maybe a couple months ago just to see, but I didn't listen to it. I don't know. I'm kind of a, I'm not afraid to listen to it. I'm just kind of like, I don't know, taken aback if I would hear her voice again. Right. Like you said, you you got kind of uh, infatuated with the whole process a little bit too much, maybe, which I could see anybody doing with with somebody that's uh, deceased and. They come through and they talk to you, and what a validation! I mean, it's that's. Not... I think it, I think it helped. I think it gave me closure that I could talk to her because I didn't get a chance to say goodbye and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, nobody knows. Nobody ever gets a really good chance to say goodbye, and uh, just kind of a a very interesting way to still talk and listen to her. But yeah, I, I did it for quite a while, almost every night, and it's like I need to stop because this is consuming my life too. So. Did Would she come through for her mother as well? Yes, she would. Anybody that would ask questions, uh, and it was definitely yeah. her voice. I played it back, and everybody's like, nope, that's her. No, I would be interested to hear your opinion on this too, Melissa. Do you guys think that's because, you know, your girlfriend, Craig, that she she was also sensitive, or she's stronger somehow, uh, even though she's on that other side. I mean, do you think that most people would have that ability to come through for seven months in a row to speak to their loved ones? I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to say, no, it can't happen. I would think that anything is possible. I mean, we've been talking to the same uh, spirits or ghosts, whatever you want to call them, at the asylum for the latter part of the year so and they're probably mm -hmm. still there now so right. probably they'll still be around mm -hmm. if you ask for them what do you think melissa yeah i mean it's we really don't know but i i do think you know if if they want to communicate with us and it doesn't mean you know that your loved one doesn't want to communicate with you it just and part of it too is some of the people that we loved know that we do this so they know that they can communicate with us, and mm. that possibly is part of it too. Right, right. The door is already already open, and them knowing mm -hmm. that before they went over. That's an interesting point. I've never heard anybody say that. That is very interesting. What about the phantom lights, or uh, you know, ghost lights, spook lights, whatever people want to call them? Have you guys witnessed those for yourselves? Oh, are you talking like uh, I haven't seen really the phantom lights. I've seen light anomalies. Um, Unless you're talking about the the spook lights they would call up in uh, Michigan called the Paulding Light, uh, stuff like that. But I've never really seen any phantom lights. But I did see something online recently about some type of electrical light that was seen traveling through the woods. It was like blue. And when it came across like uh, the metal railroad things. tracks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've seen that, That didn't was a you? cool video. Yeah. Did you see that, Melissa? Did you see that? I have not Orbe? seen that, so I'm going to have to look that, that up. That is spectacular. Like, if that's um, if that's the ball lightning 
anomaly Plasma that is yeah. amazing that is one of the longest and closest videos i've ever seen for that but i know that people are calling that out for and i haven't gone back to look at it but some people on the video have said it's cgi because of this 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 which they could be right or they could be wrong but either way it's a it's an amazing video so you mentioned the paulding lights you said that you have seen those or that's just a a story in your area no, we've I've seen them up there at uh, Waters, Michigan, uh, on the other side of uh, Wisconsin, and uh, but we've kind of debunked them as some of us have debunked them as automob <laughs> as automobile lights that are seven point five miles up the road, and wow. I did a couple videos on it, and for the most part. They are car lights, but other people have seen other things that they can't explain there as well. Hmm. So I can't really call them out on everything. I can just call out what I see as uh, car lights uh, coming from certain directions and red lights going back up the hill seven miles ahead. So mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to debunk stuff, even if you want it to, mm -hmm. to be true, right? So and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I don't r really quite recall the exact legend there, but it was tied to some railroad tracks and somebody looking for something, right? The paulding lights? Yep, there was actually two uh, legends to that. One was a conductor that was looking for his son that had fallen off the train and died, so his, that's his lantern swinging back and forth. And then there was one other one about uh, someone getting, and that was kind of a little bit sad, decapitated, and they were looking for their head, but yeah, it was just kind of weird. That was the one I remembered, was the, some somebody was unfortunately headless and, and searching yep. for that. That would be quite horrible to see. I, I get it. it reminds me of this, you know, Sleepy Hollow uh, cartoon or, or movie or legend of the, the Headless Horseman. I don't think I'd want to see anything like that. No, thanks. Nope. Especially the able I to did actually. Oops, I was going to say, I did actually have an experience there one time. Um, we were driving up the dirt road, kind of coming up the hill, and it wasn't dark yet. And all of a sudden right in front of us, like a ball of light just came across the whole road and it was super bright and then it was gone. And my husband was a huge skeptic and he even says on that, he's like, I don't know how to explain that because <laughs> like I said, it, it wasn't even dark yet. So. Did you kind of enjoy that, that he said that you're like, yes, finally saw something. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, he does believe stuff now, but as far as the paulding light, he thought it was all fake. So seeing that, at least he he can say there was something there. <laughs> right. Now, what about shadow people? What do you guys make of that? Because there's so many different types, and some interact with us and some don't. Some look very different than others. Uh, some are in our homes, and others are like mine in the woods. So what do you guys think's going on with the shadow people I He's don't, actually uh, witnessed. Oh, Craig, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> you, you, might, you might have a better story than me. Go ahead. Maybe not. Uh, we actually have witnessed shadow people at quite a few different places. Um, not to use the asylum as an example again, but the hospital rooms, there's certain rooms that always a shadow person peeks out of, and it's always the same room. So that's kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah, the, the asylum definitely has, like I, like she said, there's certain ones that people would see, the guests on the tours would see, um, the, like shadow people coming in and out of rooms and even walking down the hall, they'd see them pass in front of the, the doors and stuff. And I've seen them a couple times up at Summer Wind. We actually had a, um, one of my friends of mine, an investigator that captured a shadow underneath the porch on his video camera that came from underneath the the foundation of summer wind up to the top of the hill and he had captured that on video and uh actually unfortunately he had just passed away not long ago you might have heard about him kevin malik oh yes oh he was so nice i was so sorry to hear about that he was such a nice person yep he was uh, i went to school with him and uh oh, we've done so many different projects together yeah, he was a nice guy. I've I've only spoken to him through Messenger, but what a he was a very good person. I'm sorry that you lost him. Yeah, thank you. Uh, refresh my memory as to why shadow figures or anything else would be coming up un from under the foundation of Summerwind. 
Not exactly sure. I mean, we've seen. I mean, as, as a shadow person, isn't necessarily anything demonic or anything negative. It's just right. uh, more along the lines of why they take on that form as opposed to a different form. I mean, I've done investigations at a place in Berlin, Wisconsin, called the Berlin Tannery. We would see something that wasn't even a shadow person. Person that was more of a it had mass to it. We actually nicknamed it Hunchy because it ran close to the ground mm. or would walk really close to the ground. But instead of being dark, it would be like brown in nature and it had mass to it. It was it was, it was was weird and it would just disappear in front of your eyes it was as quick as it appeared. So Very interesting. A, a brown colored one, but it was all hunched over. Hunched over. So we actually mm. named it Hunchy. Yeah. Wow. And you saw that numerous times? Numerous times. In fact, we would be sitting by one of the hallways going into another room and would literally go right by us. And my one investigator at the time, Rick, he says, oh, my God, did you just see that? I said, how could I miss it? It just went right past me. <laughs> I guess I just want to make sure I'm not the only one. Please, someone else tell me they saw that thing. Yes, definitely. So if you guys don't mind, because uh, I know there's going to be a lot of information in the book, obviously, but can you guys share... Maybe uh, one more story from the book that that you really you really like telling. Melissa, I would talk about have you talk about Barclay Cemetery. Okay. <laughs> um, so Barclay Cemetery will be in the book. I won't go in complete detail, but that is actually close to the Paulding Light, um, kind of by Gateway Lodge and Land Lakes, just past that, more on the Michigan side. Um, so it's an, a cemetery in the middle of nowhere. So you're in the woods. We've gone there in the daytime several times, and it's peaceful. It's nice. It's quiet. Uh, the cemetery actually only has children buried in it. So it's, oh. it's very sad. Um, so we decided to go there at nighttime and do a little investigation. And the whole way there, I just knew we'd see something. I was recording immediately because I just felt it. Um, during our brief investigation, though, we definitely knew something was there. Something was watching us. Um, we saw it, something cross the road and come over by us. But it was afterward when we went over our audio. Everything that we asked, there were EVPs to answering us. And, and was it, it? did it make sense, the answers? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what for the kind of, most part, we had a couple that didn't, but right. So you guys were, I mean, what kind of questions were you guys asking considering it was all children buried there? Um, I'm trying to think Craig, what some of the stuff we were asking. Um, I honestly think what we were feeling though, and what we saw the presence was not a child and it was nothing from the cemetery. Mm. So I think a lot of res our responses weren't coming from anything from there. Mm. Yeah, it was like a, a deep male voice that was talking to, that was coming through the EVPs as well. Mm. Was there anything threatening about this entity? We were very, very, very uncomfortable there. Um, we all just had the feeling that we were being watched, almost like prowled after. <laughs> and in the end, we ended up getting scared and leaving because we heard it coming in the woods and then somebody on our team said well i think they said they were mountain lions or something so oh that's even that worse. scared us away <laughs> i don't i don't remember if he said mountain lions but whatever oh. he said we jumped in the car and left yeah that's time to go <laughs> i think i'll take the shadow people over the mountain lion goodness gracious <laughs> better chance even though you get scratched or punched i mean um a little yeah. worse with the old cats yeah, yep, yep. yeah that's kind of a bummer oh <laughs> Unless you're that that runner that was able to to handle business on the the younger one is a little sad that he, he killed it, but it was kind of either him or the cat. So, um, mm -hmm. well, thank you guys for sharing some of the stories out of your upcoming book. It is called Archives of a Ghost Hunter Two. And all right, guys, well, it's plug time, so make sure everybody knows where to find uh, each one of you on your various social media sites, and of course, uh, Fox Valley Ghost Hunters. Yep, foxvalleyghosthunters.com and Fox Valley Ghost Hunters on Facebook. And I also run uh, Wisconsin's Most Haunted Places on Facebook as well. And how about you, Melissa? I mean, that's if you want to uh, have people uh, hunt you down on Facebook or wherever. Um, I am part, part of the pages. I help moderate them and run them. So you can find me on those same pages, too. Awesome. 
Now, does it have a specific uh, day in May that it's going to be live, and is it up for pre-order yet? None of it is up yet. Uh, we're just in the process of uh, putting a lot of the articles together to put them in there. So I would hope that May um, it should be done. Awesome. I'll be looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, when you guys get another book uh, round up, give me a holler. I'd love to have you back on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm so-and-so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bar. Buddha says, forget it. That's not true. That's some of the story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. Well, nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes and consulting our memories. But then there's a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question. Uh, who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
says, uh, when you settle down in the train to read your newspaper and uh, so on, you are not the same person who uh, a little while ago left the platform. If you think you are, you are linking your moments up in the train. And this is what binds you to the wheel of birth and death. But when you know that every moment in which you are is the only moment, this comes into Zen, the master will say to somebody, oh, get up and walk across the room. And he comes back and he says, where are your footprints? They've gone. So where are you? Who are you? When we are asked who we are, we usually give a kind of recitation of a history. Straight, 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 straight.